welcome. Um, this is the Brooklyn Rails uh, 563rd New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail. And I have the um, huge pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Lydia Gurr and David Carrier. We are thrilled to welcome poet Lainey Brown here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events like here in our daily NFC. Please check the chat for a link to donate. And now to introduce today's guests and host, Lydia Gurr teaches at Columbia University and is a recipient of Mellon, Getty, and Guggenheim Fellowships. Gurr is the author of several books, including The Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, an essay in the philosophy of music, and of course, Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread, a philo philosophical detective story, which we are here to discuss and celebrate today. David Carrier has been lecturer in the Council of the Humanities and fellow in philosophy, Princeton University, a Getty, a Getty scholar and a Clark fellow uh, and a Fulbright, le Fulbright lecturer. He is also an editor at large for The Real. And um, with that, I will turn it over to you two. Thanks all so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I believe, hello, um, I'm Lydia and um, thank you very much for the invitation to speech, speak to this auspicious group. Um, I'm very pleased to be in conversation with David, whom I've known since our wonderful year at the Getty um, together. And um, we've been in conversation, I think, for the last 20 odd years. And um, I'm going to begin by just uh, introducing a kind of an overview of my book. I've been doing several of these presentations recently and uh, want to apologize for any repetition, but I'm assuming nobody's following me that often. Um, but um, I just want to give you a sense of what this book is about and then um, much of it doesn't have so much to do with visual art, but a lot of it does. And David and I will concentrate on those parts that uh, pertain to the interests of Brooklyn Rail. I'm going to begin by sharing a screen, um, which I hope will amuse you for a moment. Um, has that come through? Yes. Great, perfect. Okay. So um, I'm not going to start there. In fact, I'm going to start here. Um, the book, which is for discussion today, uh, Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread, with a beautiful design by Curtis Kaleo on the front, frontispiece, has a 19th century bucket with um, fallen red paint, with which becomes a long passage to open out into a sea. So it's all very carefully designed. Um, my, this book has a main cast of five characters, as my playbill suggests, but a chorus of thousands. I wrote this book without notes and without quotation marks as a Passagenwerk in the style of Nietzsche, Benjamin, Adorno, Wittgenstein, and of the many more writers who have experimented with a philosophical form, specifically often pertaining to the arts, but a philosophical form that has so often moved across land and language and the many seas of the world. I rewrote each passage of borrowed material to create chapters as parts of a whole. Being advised by my press 
that I ought to offer more signposts on the way, I decided to write a chapter on the very idea of posting a sign. This was very much intended to capture the way in which artworks have been reduced to sale, to commodified signs, very much a concern of Danto, but also very much a concern of Hogarth already in the 18th century. The material of my book covers many disciplines, philosophy, history, theology, politics, literature, music, theater, opera, and of course, visual art and a lot from Shakespeare. It's drawn, each passage of mine is drawn from the very first lines of texts or artworks offered as thought experiments or thought images about the exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, leading thereafter to all kinds of narratives of freedom, of liberation, of emancipation. As a detective story, my book tracks a very long history, extremely long history, of a very short anecdote. The anecdote reads, as in the bottom of the um, first image, commissioned to depict the biblical passage through the Red Sea, a painter covered a surface with red paint, explaining thereafter that the Israelites had already crossed over and that the Egyptians were drowned. Given that the Israelites had long gone, and the Egyptians are buried underneath, all you would see is a Red Sea and therefore a plain red surface. I treat this anecdote of which there are hundreds and hundreds of versions, and I tell every version, as akin to something like an enigmatic epigram, an aphorism, a proverb. The anecdote gives out one meaning while withholding an, another. It gives something to plain sight on the surface, but something also different to insight. And I want to argue that the wit of the painting, uh, of the anecdote, the way that it functions, lies in the movement between insight and sight, sight and insight, surface and depth. By the anecdote, we see all and we see nothing. And then, of course, between all and nothing, we see every shade of gray in between. Wittgenstein once imagined a good philosophical work being written from the sort of, um, he said wit, but Witz in German is a very particular term. And he wanted that Witz to be never wasted in any kind of facetiousness of thought. He had in mind the, what were called the waste books um, produced by the very witty German thought experimenter, Georg Christoph Lichtenberg, who in turn was borrowing from Shakespeare a great appreciation of a brevity of wit conditioned by the idea that even when one think, speaks or th thinks in brevity, nothing should be left out and no detail ignored. In other words, it's very difficult to be brief when writing a book about wit. Now the anecdote was first told about a wall, a wall that left spectators with nothing to see, after which it came to be told as about a red square produced on a canvas to be placed on a wall in a museum. From all the roguish early tales told by rogues about blank walls to the modern institutional walls of the mu museum, my history effectively follows that trajectory from a pre-modern to a modern history of the arts in all their agonistic contest and comparison. I look at all the different arts in competition with each other as making claims, of course, on the idea of art, on the concept of art, but also on the different mediums, or media we say, but mediums is actually a nicer word, the different mediums of the, the artworks. But insofar as I'm dealing with the contest between the arts, I'm very interested in the embattled national 
contests into which the arts enter. England against France, France against Germany, Germany, shall I say, against everybody. But actually, in this period, it's France against everybody. In these contests on land and sea, in the battles of nation states, we saw all, kind, all kinds of trading, trade wars, merchandise wars, wars involving piracy and property. And we see there that artworks are traded and looted in these wars quite as much as persons. And this ongoing um, analogy or allegory that puts artworks in relation to persons is a major theme of the story that I tell. Now, my book begins with um, Arthur Danto's um, Transfiguration of the Commonplace, just the very first lines where he says very quickly, let's consider a painting described by the Danish wit, Søren Kierkegaard. It's a painting of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. And after that, Danto tells this anecdote from which then, this, from this opening gambit of the Exodus, works out through a very complex philosophical argument, what's called his famous end of art thesis. And according to his end of art thesis, he makes a claim that for the first time in America, if not really only in Manhattan, all art contra the past will now be included in his concept of art contra the entire history of a kind of exclusionary project of definition, which left too much out. And because he's dealing with this narrative of inclusion and exclusion, he, it enables him to see in post-war America, the way in which the definition of art, his definition of art could serve as what he calls a harbinger for a notion of total freedom in the political world as a whole. And the first part of my book traces Danto's philosophy of art, as I think it's never tra been traced before, as a, a thesis, a philosophy of liberation, first off, that he started with the Exodus and produced a theory of liberation out of it. And I don't think that anyone's read Danto this way before, but David will surely correct me. The second part of my book treats the exactly the same anecdote that Danto tells as actually occurring in the very first line of Puccini's opera, his most famous opera, La Boheme. My question is, what has La Boheme got to do with the crossing of the Red Sea? And you probably being not that so interested in opera, maybe you are, maybe we can talk about that too. Um, there's an incredibly interesting way in which the very concept of la boheme, which becomes a thesis about how to live an artistic life in the, under modern conditions, beginning in Paris, um, with um, this gentleman's Henri Mouget, Saint de la Vie de Boheme. Um, there's a very interesting way in which this view of what la boheme is, as an artistic concept has to borrow from a much older concept of la boheme, which is anything but an, um, like a nice story of living a free life. It's actually a story about the persecution equally of the Israelites and the Egyptians. And the reason why um, the Israelites and the Egyptians get enfolded into a long um, narrative of Bohemia before it ever reaches Paris is what a major part of my book is about. It's a story that hasn't, uh, people sort of know, but hasn't been well documented. But let me just for one second play you a clip so you see what I'm talking about. This is um, a Swiss performance in the Hochhaus performed, uh, performing the opening center, uh, 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 line of La Boheme. Can you hear? Hmm. No. 
You can't hear. No. Um, Shitsky. Um, what should I do? Sing it. <laughs> <laughs> if my partner was here. Um, well, um, I'll try and work it out, um, but I don't, I don't want to take now. Um, now. But um, he, uh, Marcello comes in, uh, he's painting his painting, which in most productions you never see. Um, and he uh, sings out, this Red Sea, it's making me shiver. I feel as if it were flowing right over me, droplet by droplet. So in revenge, I'm going to make the Pharaoh drown. And my question in reading Puccini's La Boheme is to ask what Marcello as the painter, what his decision to murder the Pharaoh means in relation to the murder that we all know that occurs in the opera of La Boheme when Mimi, as it's, and it's described as a murder, must die at the end. Her death, which is foretold from her very first notes, is a murder, I argue, closely correlated to Marcello's murder of Pharaoh in the very first lines of the opera. So there's this in, entirely interesting project, which lies in the center of my book, really, again, to repeat, raising the question of what does La Boheme have to do with the crossing of the Red Sea. And I only notice this as an important project because if you go around the world and ask anybody how this opera begins, nobody knows, nobody can remember. Even people who've put on the opera forget that there's this mm. sentence, this Red Sea, as the opening line of the opera. And, and forgetting that first line is very similar to the fact that almost nobody working in Danto scholarship has ever noticed the first line of the transfiguration of the commonplace as being about the exodus and take, making that an important moment. Parts four and five of my book are very much to do with the color theory pertaining to the idea of the crossing of the Red Sea being red. Why is this the preoccupation with the passage being the Red Sea? We know this is a misnomer, it was the Sea of Reeds. Why does it come to be called the Red Sea? Why is then there a historical trajectory which links it to what's then later as by Milejevich, but Alphonse Saleh and many, many other painters? Why is it linked to the history of monochrome painting, which gives special priority to the Red Sea? Just remember that in Milejevich's famous black square exhibition, this famous exhibition of his monochromes, the black sea paint, uh, the, sorry, not black sea, that's a mistake. The black painting, the black square painting is hung in the corner of the exhibition, precisely in the place called the red corner of beauty in the, uh, where the Russian icon is hung. So that top corner of a room, which is a place of beauty, comes to be occupied for Malevich by the black square, where in, um, in uh, Russia, we're not allowed to talk about Russia anymore, but, um, but in that moment in a room, that top corner is called the place of beauty. And that brings, and so I talk a lot about the history of red and color theory and the monochrome and the red thread, why Goethe named his Rotefaden red. It wasn't originally called red, so why red? The last part of my book, which is very much devoted to art history, um, 18th century art history, shows why the Red Sea anecdote, which I've been tracking throughout the book, was, um, ends up as a story about the middle of the 18th century, bang, back in London, where I happen to be born, that's one reason, but in the middle of 18th century London, with Hogarth being told that he is the reason for the Red Sea anecdote being told. Everybody attributes the Red Sea anecdote in its 200 or so versions told in high literature and entertainment literature to blame Hogarth and say it was because of Hogarth. Now, one of the main reasons it's because of Hogarth is because if you look in this little corner at the top 
corner again, that tiny corner, which should be called the beautiful corner. This is the first scene of Marriage a la Mode, his famous se series, um, Marriage a la Mode. Of the, um, um, he, you see here a, a, a piece of the drawing um, in the top corner, which is claimed by many, 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 many interpreters to be again Pharaoh in the Red Sea. What we want to ask ourselves, has Pharaoh in the Red Sea got to do with the negotiation of a marriage contract going on below? What has the Red Sea and the anecdote got to do with the issue of marriage? And my book ends up with a theory less about contracting marriage, where the notion of contracting is also like contracting a disease, but has a lot to do with the discourse of marriage and adultery in the 18th century, which I suggest is one of the um, dominant themes amongst people like Shaftesbury and Jonathan Swift and um, uh, Lawrence Stern and Hogarth. It's what I call a kind of domestic wit, a wit which finds its meaning all the way into the bedroom. And that notion of a domestic wit in the bedroom is connected to the true first version of the anecdote, which is the solution to my entire mystery story, which I'm not going to reveal to you today. But that too ends up in the bedroom and has very much to do with um, biblical brothers going back all the way to the Old Testament and the constant um, uh, contests between two brothers. So this was also a very Hogarthian theme. My book begins with that sentence by Danto appealing to Kierkegaard's wit. I ask, what kind of wit is this? I follow a theory of wit as a genealogy of the very idea of liberty. No wit without liberty, no liberty without wit. I produced the wit, I, or I framed the wit into a detective story, which is all about the detection of clues. I work out a method where the art history is, and, and for all the arts, draws our attention to the most telling details of artworks. These are the details that usually get overlooked like first lines of operas. This is what my book is about, these micrological telling details. I know that someone's here today in our group, namely Paul Borowski, and I learned an enormous amount from him because he produced the same kind of wit of telling details in Renaissance paintings. So to him, I'm very grateful. Um, but this is what my book is about. 600 pages about a joke, and um, but it's got a lot of serious stuff happening on the way. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, that's great. Thanks, good beginning. Um, I, I, I have, on one hand, seven pages of questions for you, and <laughs> the other hand, seven pages of notes. So I figure that by Friday we'll be finished, Friday noon, I would. I would hope. Um, Lydia, we, once... Um, David, before we start, could we just encourage that people who want to right. uh, put chat questions in are welcome to do so yeah. and um, to um, interrupt in Absolutely, all kinds sure. of ways. Yeah, let's, yeah. let's do that. Yeah, because this is, it, it's unfinishable and so it should be interrupted, I think. Um, Lydia, I thought about the book a few months ago, and as you know, reviewed it in February, and I thought I sort of understood it. And then when I started for this session about a week ago, I started to read it, I took notes, and I took notes on the notes. I mean, you know, the notes have got layers of stuff. And I thought, oh, I don't know what to do about this. Last night, I put on a performance, a CD, Maria Callas of Le Boheme, I thought maybe that would help. Well, that was a strange thing. But then what I did 
it's funny how sometimes philosophers don't see what's in front of them, was I looked at the cover of the book. Now, I mean, the book is right here. It's not hard to find the cover, uh, <laughs> but I, I caught the words. This was late last night. Yeah. It, it's a detective story and it's philosophical. Mm. And I get the concept of a detective story. I get the concept of philosophy. I used to be a philosopher, but the combination is he struck me as sort of interesting because when I started to think about it, I thought, well, I don't really think that there are, I mean, detective stories, there's Sherlock Holmes, et cetera, the more recent ones, and then there are philosophy books, but I don't think of the intersection of those two categories as being sort of typical. I, I couldn't think of a, a philosophy. I suppose you could say that Kant or Hegel are doing detective stories, but not really. And so when I thought of your book that way, I thought, well, that's interesting because then the question is, if I understand the cover, is uh, what's the story? I mean, a detective story ends up with a, you find the murderer, you find the event, you find the victim, you find so forth. And that must be what the book is about. Now, this is slightly comic, given that I'd read it a couple of times, but I mean, it does, it does point at the categories. Now, one reference I have going outside the book is this essay, which I think we both know, Arthur Danto has an essay called Philosophy as an of Literature, was a presidential address yeah. to the philosophers in which he gives a list too long to read of all the different literary forms of philosophy and pointing out the philosophy as a field is very, is very good at generating all sorts of forms, but he doesn't mention detective stories. And I think it's very interesting that in this way, one of your achievements, a small one maybe, but a part of this is that you've enlarged the genre of philosophy forms to include a detective story. Okay, so um, I wish I could say that I was the, <laughs> I was the first to do so, <laughs> but um, on my side of philosophy, which is not quite yours, David, I ha I um, I'm very familiar with the work of Krakauer, Siegfried Krakauer, and Walter Benjamin, yeah. and Ernst Bloch, and all of them being um, coming out of both the Marxist and Freudian tradition, but also working in what we call critical theory, were acutely aware of the way that philosophical theories are constantly tested by the details that we call the material. We mm -hmm. philosophers are always doing material. Material can be big artworks and it can be tiny little things, pieces of waste, Kierkegaard says. So mm -hmm. crumbs, what are called, uh, Kierkegaard mean crumbs. And the thing is, how do you take this material and make it and allow something philosophical to emerge from it? Mm -hmm. Now, most philosophers are very prone to um, make material simply fit the theory. They mm -hmm. have the theory in mind. They use the material as a testing ground for the theory. But in the kind of critical theory that I do, I want the philosophical issues to emerge from the material mm -hmm. so that one then has to pay enormous attention to the material to see where th theoretical claims or urges towards generality and so on come to play. Let me give you an ex exa example of two philosophers with whom I've had enormous contact and stand in disagreement. Um, Danto, when he turned to his form of philosophical art criticism, addressed absolutely wonderful details. He was a wonderful uh, picker-upper of things mm -hmm. to think about. But his conclusions always came back to the same narrative right. about the end of art. And it was as if he did this beautiful detour of his essay and then said, as I've said 
a hundred right. times before, right. and the theoretical conclusion came out. But his conclusion was never really tested by the material because he only mm -hmm. took the material that already affirmed what he wanted to prove. Right. Right. So this sort of, even at the end of his life, I mean, a few weeks um, when he finished his book, What is Art? And uh, he called me up on the phone. He said, I've had an incredible breakthrough, Lydia. It's a marvelous breakthrough. Right. I've suddenly realized that the artist I should be looking at is Andy Warhol. And I said, but Arthur, you've been doing that for 50 years. And he said, I know I have, but now I really understand why yeah, yeah, yeah. it's so good yeah. for my project. So it was this incredible creativity. But his conclusion was always in, somehow independently corroborated right. by a philosophical theory that he had. Yeah, but, no, I know about that. And I mean, that's kind of funny because... I mean, some of the, the catalogs, this became a joke among in the art world that yep. it always came back to, to Warhol's Brillo box, even with someone like Robert Irwin. And you say, well, Irwin, I don't really think yeah, exactly, it's that right. yeah. connection, but we come, it's, mm. it, it's like every joke has the same punchline. And you say, well, we lead up to that. But let me push but, this. But hold on, hold on, David. Yeah. Let me just finish the other thing. The other example was my doctor father from Cambridge, Bernard yeah. Williams, who was a great moral philosopher who said no. to me that every time he did the philosophy of opera, he did it precisely in the way to look into the opera for the yeah. bits that affirmed his theory of indeterminacy yeah, and yeah. Moral psychology. Yeah. And however good his theory was, he never looked beyond it. And I said to Bernard, don't you think you have an obligation to actually pay attention to all the details of the, yeah. op the opera to see what doesn't fit right. the theory as well as what does fit? But right. this notion of fittingness to theory is what Krakauer, Adorno and people really don't, do. I mean, sometimes they do it too, but Krakow right. is brilliant in this regard, and Benjamin certainly, they allow the contradictions between the material and the theoretical claims to stay in place, so that you don't get right. the constant fit. Yeah, Fitting, yeah. And so it's the unfittingness that gives you that kind of wit and purpose in spending so much time with the material. That's yes, that's yeah. that's wonderful because, of course, the question that poses is, do you really need all the material at all if you're just going to get to that conclusion? You say, well, we don't need the warm up. But let me let me in a sense let me turn that inside out because when you look at Danto's uh, materials, you say, well, does he really need the examples at all? Because let's take and this I thought of as one kind of question about your book. Yeah. Suppose you say, I want to talk about what does he start with about the red squares and different ones, and can those be different works of art, et cetera, et cetera. You say, well, I don't really need to refer to Kierkegaard. I don't really need to refer to the examples because it's a pure thought experiment. I just, I just generate these. And even if no one in the history of the world has ever made such things, we can, we can think about them perfectly well. Right. But then, you see, if I can joke about your book, you would end up with a much shorter book, probably about 12 pages, right? Because they don't need that material. But let me take this into a thought that's connected to what you were saying here. And I'll give references because I know the students are taking notes here. They know about the quiz later, right? And they're going to yeah. want to get this all clear. You talk on page three about the thought experiment, on page five about Dento's politics. You have a very interesting note on page nine about his anxiety towards analytic philosophy and 21 social anxiety. And uh, 41, you talk about the politics of analytic philosophy. Well, the, the interesting question here, I think, is how, you, you see, do we read the procedure here? Because would you say that the division between a kind of traditional analytic philosopher and you is you wanting to take the examples very seriously and work through them and saying you can't just wave your hands and say red squares, red squares like Kierkegaard, mm -hmm. but you have to spell it out in considerable, considerable detail. 
Um, it's a, I'll, I'll, I'll answer two questions. Why, why not yeah. the 12 page version of my book? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yesterday, I was talking to my visiting scholars at Columbia about my sort of erotic fetish almost with details. But part of, part of the reason why I put in so many details and retold so many stories and so many arguments is because all the material I pick up on is extremely well known. It's extremely familiar right. I mean, to the learned people of the world. <laughs> um, everybody knows Balzac's story. Everybody knows Dante. Everybody knows, you know, there's right. a sort of way in which people, but what people do is that they constantly repeat phrases, right. words, metaphors, examples, and errors. They constantly repeat right. mistakes of quotation and so on. So I decided to do two things. One is to show um, just how much repetition of material there was. Right. Just to show how that everybody um, commits a sort of grand, what's called a grand plagiarism of borrowed right. materials. Right. Um, they very few people acknowledge where they get their materials from right they the art is to borrow it and not get caught to change enough things so it's not obviously a theft there's good plagiarism and bla yeah. bad plagiarism a, a distinction made precisely in the 18th century uh, by my english boys um so one of the things I wanted to do is say, you've all read this story, you all know this opera, you all know this artwork, and never did you see this detail. And no. if you think about my, uh, most of you won't know this, but my very first book, which was when I was doing analytic philosophy, right. and I asked the question, what kind of thing is a musical work? I shifted, I cured myself of analytic philosophy precisely by asking, why does everybody start this project by asking about Beethoven? I questioned the example mm -hmm. that everybody used. And because of that, turned yeah. to do a very different kind of philosophy from analytic. Um, and I think that's an imp a, important thing. And uh, uh, Joseph Raz, who just died last week, um, who was a very dear friend of mine, used to say to me, thought experiments are designed, Lydia, with the most complete control over the selection of the pertinent mm -hmm. detail. You leave most stuff aside. He said, but in your writing, you don't leave anything out. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. never sharpen the focus to get exactly to mm -hmm. what should be yeah. the experiment with yeah. thought. Yeah, and that's so, important. I, and yeah, I think it's a real difference. Yeah. What I would add here to spread the blame around is that it's the same problem in art history. I know that when when I started art to get into art history and published, for example, a long essay about Caravaggio interpretation, what struck me is that the interpretations tended to be more cribbed from the earlier interpretations rather than from looking at the work. And that's why when the errors get there, people keep saying the same thing. He said, she said, he said, he yeah, said, and they right. keep yeah, exactly. doing the same. But let me let me put this in a push this in a different way, because I think that I mentioned just now, there's so many themes here, um, about Danto and politics. And here's one story. I wonder how we want to play this. That Danto's thesis that became best known was the end of art history, the Hegelian idea that he picked up that art history was over and there would be wonderful things that wouldn't go any further. And one of the anecdotes I have is that, of course, at that point in the 80s, there was a man who's still around, Francis Fukuyama, who had a view of the end of history. And his thesis was that liberal democracy was the wave of the future. And from here on out, that's what it was going to be. Now, I, I just I happened to read about him yesterday because, of course, oh, yes, Fukuyama has book. had to, right. to write new books <laughs> to explain why his earlier hmm. book was wrong. But it was interesting with Danto that I really tried to get him to say something about the Fukuyama. Did he think there was some analogy between you see the end of art history and the end of history period. And that never interested him at all. I don't know, you may have more. 
Well, that he, never, he wanted, that was not his. Well, the, the end of art thesis as promoted by, by Danto is no. actually not an end of art thesis. What it is, is an, um, a, it's a, the achievement of a definition which brings to an end the project of defining art. It's mm -hmm. the end of a certain kind of philosophy of art. Right. And this is what got down to into a difficulty. On the one hand, he celebrated also in yeah. the, around 1984, his becoming a philosophical critic, right. because if he hadn't done the criticism, what would he have done? I mean, right. it, there would That's have right. been nothing left to say after yes. he'd finished the philosophical project. Yeah. On the other hand, he just kept repeating the philosophical project. Right, also, right, right. Which I think is interesting. But I think for him, he contradicted himself in so many ways because, of course, art was never going to come to an end, just right. a certain pressure on itself right, right. to reach its definition. Right. History was never going to come to an end precisely yeah. because future events in history were going to allow us to rework right, right, our right, interpretation yeah, yeah. of the past according to his view right. of history. So he wanted these all to be working right. together, but right. there were really deep tensions, which I tried to bring out. But there's an, an, um, another issue which um, I saw someone raising in the chat thing about what it means for people to repetitively um, re re repeat, constantly repeat um, errors that are made. Um, it's people often repeat misquotations. Often now with the internet, you see famous quotations by Goethe or Hegel or Schmegel, Bagel, whoever you want on the internet. And what happens is that people quote those and they never go back to the source. Right, right. And one thing that I was very important to me and it took me 13 years to write this book, so it was a lot of work, was that I not only went back to the sources, I had to go back to the first editions to check mm -hmm. for right, missions right, right. and to work with the constant issue of translation. Yeah. And I think probably of all the things I discovered in um, working through my book was that translation is mm -hmm. where meaning really gets twisted and turned in these embattled things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I have one argument in my book about Victor Hugo's Notre Dame, where one of the earliest uh, translators of this book, just after the 1830s, right. actually discovered that all of the language came from mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, uh, Hugo had put all this um, language into the novel Mm -hmm. The novel became a classic yeah, for its yeah, period, yeah. but then when translated, it didn't translate back right, to the terms right, that right, were already right. in the English right. vernacular. Right. And I just want to say this notion yeah. of translation as right. a way of talking about the transmission of meaning doesn't involve a kind of error where you say, well, now I've got it right and so on, but it encourages one never to just simply take on, take on first reading the sort of surface of any text. Right. Language is doing so much work. And this is what we see, of course, in those the brilliant art historians who can see for these details in painting and go on interpreting and interpreting all with, with this, these sort of new right. Right. layers of meaning. Right. Yeah. I mean, the repetitions are, I mean, in part, of course, those are a, a function of fame, because when he was asked to do lots of lectures, inevitably, you know, the lectures would come out of the earlier ones. But leaving that somewhat aside, I wondered, you see, if one could try to generalize a bit from the method of your book, you speak, you know, again, for the students who want to know, it's 581 about originality, 583 about the politics and how your book is not a closed book. And I mean, after all, you have a lot of students, right? I mean, you have people that are following. And so what kind of uh, response are you looking for? I mean, something that goes beyond repeating the cliches. Um, <laughs> um, 
and I was asked this recently in another context, and it's uh, I would sort of I wouldn't wish my uh, wish my method upon anyone. It takes so much work, <laughs> and it takes so long. Um, but I I I would I think that I have very much encouraged my students to pay attention um, both to sources not to stick with only what the contemporary people are saying about particular artworks, to right. read against the grain, to um, find something um, um, of, the, of their own in a sense. I, I'm not the kind of um, professor who wants a, a, a group of disciples. What I want, um, someone, um, Mr. Schwartz, um, wrote um, to uh, in the notes. Um, Do you think they all, all of my characters, want to dispel self-deception and illusion to make it possible to live an authentic life? Um, I would. The problem of authenticity is one of the main problems of my book because the claim of authenticity, the claim that you belong to um, either a group of artists or you belong to a school or you are, are a disciple is the genealog genealogical um, anxiety that gets so many people to be excluded. If you think about the history of the Old Testament as telling a story, he begot, he begot, he begot mm -hmm. this person and this family of all families and who gets to belong. You see that this notion of authenticity disappears precisely um, in, in the roguish tales that make, make like Solomon's contest with Markov, who make an absolute joke out of one person begetting another. We know that all kinds of naughtiness goes on in begetting families. Right, I, I um, can see that, but let and, me go back. But no, let me just finish it. Yeah, yeah. Wittgenstein tells you that in family <clears throat> resemblance theory, don't look for the authentic thread that of essence that's gonna uh -huh. make you a true belonger. Get rid of that kind of stuff. Right. Start to look for the complexity that gives the riches to the language and to the form of life. And you have a much right. prettier, much more interesting notion of family resemblance. Okay, but I mean, maybe there, I, think, I mean, it's almost you're reading my mind because I would say that the lesson of your book, and this is to put it in a perversely paradoxical way, is not to simply make a general statement, which could be, as we said, 12 pages. So here you say, here's your definition of art and bump up, we can explain it, but is to work through lots of examples. And you can't just wave your hands and say, well, look at opera, look at, look at Hogarth, look at the 18th century, but you have to work at them in some fine detail you have to spell it all out because maybe when you spell it all out you find that there are things that contradict the generalization i mean that's a simple reason yeah, to do exactly. all the work yeah the the um one there's someone in the in the chat who's asked also about the issue of style and i think that's very important yeah. here if the question was about my style of writing one reason for not putting notes in was I yeah. wanted readers to do their own work. I didn't want to make it easy as to where I got all my material. Right. I used italics of phrases so you could go to the internet right. and see the 40,000 people who'd already used a, that language. That was sort of, that would be fun. It would be right. to engage in your, own, in your own research. I wanted not to make it easy. I also, um, in every single, um, passage of my book, for example, I'll give you an example. I would take, say, a very, very famous story by Balzac, which lasts mm -hmm. many, many pages, and I would reduce it to one page. Every mm -hmm. single word would be taken from the story itself, both in French and in English translation, right. would then be turned and twisted yeah. to make a brief like compression of the story no. so that anybody who knew the story would read my version and either say i don't recognize this at all right. 
Right. Which would be a, a very good response, or because I probably got most of it wrong. Right. Or they would say, "Oh my God, I never saw it this way ever." And right. if can I, get, yeah, Lydia, yeah. can I? I'm the person who asked the question. Um, yeah. So can I just ask? First of all, I cannot wait to read this book. Um, it it looks fascinating, and I'm, I'm fast. And this is a wonderful discussion that I wish was almost a day. <laughs> you know, I feel like I wish we had more time to to talk about this. And I just I'm I'm really curious about this because I'm a novelist, and I spend most of my time condensing large amounts of material into a sentence. Yeah. And whether it's because of my neurological. Um, you know, makeup or because I've done that for so long, when something is long, I'm always thinking, how do I distill it? So I'm asking you for your book. Is that just, there's no way to distill it. It's just, you've got to take the whole brilliant epic narrative you've written in, or can you just talk a little about that? Um, <laughs> it's, um, when I submitted it first, it was longer. And I was told to get rid of, you know, 100,000 words. So I did. <laughs> and so I compressed it down and down and, and so on. <laughs> right, do you ethnic? Uh, it's really five books that I've written. Uh -huh. one. So each, and each serves on its own, but they're all connected through one story. And um, I, I, you know, I doubt there'll be more than three readers in the world who will actually read it, but, you know, beginning to end. But it's, um, it's, but one thing I didn't do was um, I didn't, I didn't try to um, make a kind of claim on the rightness mm -hmm. of the compression because each one is a reading what for example did you know in Balzac's famous story of the unknown masterpiece that he's mm -hmm. telling the red sea anecdote in the middle of it yeah like nobody knows that it's like, it's giving uh, me the feeling that I'm yeah. traveling to a country and it's up to me to explore it that's what this it is. is it? And I say that. And in fact, before publishing it, I wanted just to, I, I found this extremely rich man in California. And we talked about the possibility of him supporting um, a project where I would simply post the book mm -hmm. in total on the internet. And then people would add new passages that spun out from it so it would become a collective enterprise because after all it couldn't possibly ever end i mean um, maybe one way to to add this yeah uh <laughs> and from my ex reading experience is that yeah. i found myself thinking i can understand every sentence of the book it's not obscure i mean a lot of long philosophy books you know hegel oh there's are, no there's no horrid difference no there's no, no there's no there's no <laughs> there's no deconstructionist vocabulary there's no uh, so forth and yet you could read the whole thing and say but i don't know i get the whole and in a sense that's the point at which i think that you as a reader are supposed to start working on it and i mean we are we have after all in philosophy i mean i don't want to reduce everything to precedence but we have lots of models of excessively long books i mean flaubert with the i mean uh, sartre with those accounts of early flaubert where he doesn't get very far and his genet and so forth so it's not as if the book is completely unknown though this particular subject matter is known i mean that's i think a very interesting thing about the reading experience i mean it is true maybe and i just throw this out um that in our culture, I mean, there is all this pressure to go quickly, to go fast and so forth. And we read everything, I mean, swiftly. And in that way, the book is resisting the current because yeah. it demands a lot of attention. Well, if you've ever tried to read um, Nietzsche or Kierkegaard yeah. or indeed Hegel, or you've sat through the Ring Opera, which yeah. is quite long, It'll get you from New York to Florida. It's, <laughs> um, you know, it's, there's a lot of work to be done and you can read this in bits slowly. You might, for example, as some people readers will be, 
only interested in La Boheme mm -hmm. and they'll read the opera bits and they won't know the whole. But for, so, um, in fact, the question of it's being reviewed by anyone apart from you, David, is problematic because who the hell has time to review a book like this? So what we're doing now is actually doing collective reviews, having workshops where three people will submit a kind of review angle, which okay. is, again, something creative corresponding yeah. to the kind of project it is, which I like very much. And, um, and this, um, and the, but the other thing to be said is the, um, if you read chapter one and then you read the last chapter and then you go back and read the introduction, I spent so much time on the introduction. The introduction really does kind of pull it together. It should be, you know, like Hegel's prefaces, they should right. be read at the end. You've gone through the phenomenology of spirit and then you go back to the preface, which is yeah. kind of setting out of the terms before the narrative begins. But each of the chapters is kind of self-enclosed, but we, we live in a world where we're meant to summarize and understand books within 10 minutes. Right. Um, I did, this, uh, here's the kind of joke uh, very much about my temperament. I live with an opera singer, a tenor, and when, and we've been together many decades, and we always used to go to the opera, but because I get up at four in the morning, I've never been able to, I never knew how any opera ended because I could never make it through to the end. So I, I applied for a Guggenheim fellowship, which I got to write a book on how operas begin so that I'd never have to <laughs> tell anyone how they ended because I had no idea. And it was a parody. So I started to work on beginnings and this idea of always starting kind of stayed with me for decades. And so this book is all about first lines. And another context in which that happens, you know, when you're reading a book, I know David's like this and I know others who are like this. Um, and Dante was like this, definitely. You read a book and by the time you've got to the end of page one, you already want to go away and start writing yourself mm. and so on. And you've done enough and you never really get back to the book. You quickly ru run through it and see how it ends. Um, a bit like student papers, but so, but right? See, yeah, too. So. And there's something so compelling about how everything begins. And so many people, some people like Edward Said have written wonderful books on beginnings and people like Commode wrote this great book on the sense of an ending. Right. But everybody remembers endings, but very few people remember how things begin. And I thought that was an interesting phenomenon that when in life experience, we tend to, you know, we remember the end of the marriage, not yeah. the beginning, for example. So I thought that, um, Thinking about beginning means yeah, that we're yeah. always returning to yeah, beginnings, yeah. but not with the Heideggerian sense of yeah. finding the truth in the origin. That I, yeah. I, don't I mean, what you say, Lydia, about length is very interesting. I mean, I've recently, when I've been doing exhibition reviews for The Rail and for another journal, I got used to the unit of thought was 1100 words, and that's it, you have to say it. And then it's quite odd, you see, then when you have to do a book, because I have a book here, 70,000 words, and, ah, that's 70 reviews. I mean, how am I, you see, the scale up is, <laughs> it's like, I say, well, I can cook a dinner for two, but a dinner for 50, how much, <laughs> you know, it, it, so length is, is very interesting here. And I mean, the challenge, I must say that there's one point in your book where you say, well, I've talked about red, but I haven't talked about green. Uh -oh. oh, please, please. <laughs> Don't give it away. That's the last page. Don't give the secret away. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, yeah. Mom's no, away. I mean, it, it, it is um, that, that question about color theory is completely fascinating because there are so many books yeah. now on red and yeah. blue and white and black. But, what, but very few people know the foursome, and that is black, white, gray, and red. And those four colors, as they work through the literature of 
England in the 18th century mm. and go into the French literature of the 19th yeah. century becomes part of the discourse of um, the problem of monochrome, of what's black mm -hmm. and white, the shades of gray that mm -hmm. come between these two extremes. But these two extremes, black and white, being the two non-colors that always have to find that admixture, always aiming towards this notion of harmony or beauty, which is designated by the color red. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the wit, the amusement, the critique that goes into this sort of color theory is that um, uh, black and white, as you see in um, paintings of contrast or in early perspectival, mm -hmm. I mean, long before Escher, you got it on the, already in the 15th century, mm -hmm. you have floors and walls painted in black and white squares to show you what's called um, the crisscross wit. This is extremely mm -hmm. important to how we look at early paintings where you see squares juxtaposing different things where the, there are no shades of gray. It's meant to be worked out and there's a failure to achieve a kind of harmony in the picture. And if you look at the history of comedy and um, satire, in the history of painting, um, especially with Hogarth, this crisscross wit is a major mm -hmm. part of it. And it very much accounts for early tellings of my anecdote, which is why it's there. By the way, every passage in my book, sorry, every passage in my book has the condition that it has to bear on a particular telling of the anecdote. Mm -hmm. And that this is crucial, that that's the kind of condition of entry. So there's many people who don't appear in my book who should, but that's because they didn't, they didn't get, um, they didn't get to the anecdote. But <laughs> since so many did, I was pretty lucky. And mm. Are there things from chat here that we want to get? I'm um, trying to look down this. Think, it's, um... Yeah. GE yeah. did. Can I unmute you? Did you get to? Let's. Yeah. I I, I guess I had a second one that almost <laughs> dovetailed on what you already answered. And thank you so much for this wonderful. I I want to see this as a a series, a podcast, a film. <laughs> no, this goes everywhere. I love it. Thank yeah. you. But in, in the end, and I get a question about authenticity. In the end, aren't reflection and intellect insufficient to overcome these illusions of authenticity without appropriation of will? And don't each of these characters sort of create a way as to do something to the reader to elicit a kind of self-transformation? Um, I would say that every single one of the, char the characters of the book is involved in notions, not only of self-transformation, but the transformational capabilities of art. So if the, um, the way in which the content and form of art helps the sort of transformation of meaning, that's definitely the case. Um, the transformation of the self is more complicated because one of, one of the things, if I tell my anecdote again, in a fuller version. A painter arrives at a particular place. It might be a court, it could be a museum, and a patron is there. And the patron says, I will pay you for a certain price if you'll paint the crossing of the Red Sea. Oh. And the page, a painter goes away and says, how am I gonna do this? I'm not so happy with the amount I'm getting paid Maybe I'll just take a shortcut and do this quickly. So he gets a bucket of paint, throws it over the wall, and the patron comes back the next morning and he says, I thought you were going to paint me the crossing of the Red Sea. And the patron says, well, I was. Um, I did. And he said, but where are the Israelites? He said, well, they've already crossed. And where are the Egyptians? They've already drowned. Oh. Now, the oh. anecdote is told very often to draw a distinction between those who have the capacity to see and those who do not. D 
Dante's philosophy of art is premised on those who, under a condition nobody understands, belong to the art world. And right. therefore, when they see Red Sea, a red square, they can say that's the Red Sea. And then this figure that he calls Testudora, the hard headed one who can <laughs> only ever see the wall with red paint and can't transmute it into meaning. He hasn't got the concept of art. He's like, a, you know, he has no human concept, right. as Danto says. Now, Danto's theory that distinguishes between those who can see and those who can't see follows is a philosophical version of a horrible social history where beginning um, with the demands of aesthetic theory, there are some people who have the capability to see right. painting for its value and those who don't. There's a connoisseurship, a development of taste, of capability of mind that allows you to do it. And those who are capable of meeting, for example, the Kantian or Schopenhauerian or Hegelian condition of aesthetic consciousness are the ones capable pretty much of being also to see the divine in the ordinary. It's that kind of divination or aesthetic capability. But for example, Schopenhauer says, you know, this kind of talent we'll have in principle, anybody could cu cultivate it, but we need some people to do the work around town. So let's exclude the Jews and let's exclude the women. And that you think that's a joke, but it's not because Wagner will say, for example, the, the Germans don't include the Jews as an authentic group. The Jews come from a different language. They do not rightly belong. Therefore, they cannot compose German music. So poor old, old Mendelssohn has to get into all this, you know, uh, conversion narrative. I'm producing right. Christian music. I'm right composing as a Protestant, even if I was born a Jew. And we know where that g gets us. And that kind of cultural exclusion works through my entire narrative. It's the worst part of the history of the anecdote that it tests those who can see and those who can't. And that idea of cultivating the self, the self to produce a self-enclosed club and clubbiness is what La Boheme is all about. Who belongs to the club? is a very divisive narrative mm. um, and it, it gets exposed throughout the history of philosophy and aesthetic theory. Yeah, that's... But, but I just wanted to add my conclusion that yeah. sadly, most of the figures I treat in the book um, are figures, as one question asked me at the beginning of our chat, I would never want to have dinner with anymore. They're all writing about freedom and toleration and so on. And they, their prejudice is out there displayed or denied and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm trying to do a political correctness. I'm trying to address the way in which <coughs> philosophy has constantly <coughs> tried to do away with prejudice but has found ways to bring it in through um, uh, convoluted claims about authenticity and belonging. Mm -hmm. And so, that, yeah. and that's a major part of what yeah. the political argument of my book. I yeah, I think Lily, that's, I mean, I, I had some thoughts about that in relation to your book right now, because it seems to me that's what's happened in the art world really in the past few years rather suddenly is a move from some sort of a universal aesthetic, everyone sees these things too, to looking at particular identities and assisting very strongly that your race, your gender are, are heavily determining what you do. And that, that's a complicated, as you know, political commentary. And one way, this kind of notion of universality is something everyone can, anyone can join. That is the point of it with someone like Greenberg was she didn't need any particular training. You didn't need any particular instruction. You didn't need to be an art historian. You had this experience and anyone could have it. But of course, it didn't always play out like that in practice. So this is a, here, I mean, it seems to me like 
the present issues are really complicated. Well, there's a, there's some uh, political identity theory as we know it today, um, in its more interesting and its in it also in its very bad forms, is very much a part um, of. Uh, of the kinds of issues that I was trying to deal with, right. people making a claim on their identity, what it means to be French, what it means to be yeah. part of a, a, a group right. and so on in this period of modernity that we're dealing with. We see it all the time. But what I noticed in, as the best part of the contribution of all, all my characters rather than where they were just being foul and they were often quite foul, all of them, yeah. Thus, my hesitancy to have the main course with them. I prefer the appetizers. Is that a lot of them in their theories of art um, in, uh, engage what I, I like to think about as this indeterminacy of identity, indeterminacy mm -hmm. of meaning, or what is cultivated as the wit of ambiguity. So, I like to see, for example, myself. As, um, as a force field of conflicting identities. I'm woman, I'm this, sometimes I'm this, that. And they don't all play together. They, mm -hmm. I'm many things to myself. And my claim to be one thing to myself is my own illusion about some ego that is never held firmly in place. And the best of our artworks move, um, move between this transformation of meaning, not Danto's rather static idea that the commonplace becomes transformed and we get the transformed meaning as fixed through intention and an artwork. Mm -hmm. He didn't even really believe that, but he didn't, he didn't do as well as many of the theorists um, who see in a painting conflicting notions of meaning. I remember, for example, being in the Detroit Museum of Art with Volheim, and we were sitting before a great Riesdale painting. And he said to me, what do you see? And I thought I wouldn't dare say in front of you. I was in my twenties at the time. And he said, where do you think the source of the sun is? And we spent three hours looking at mm -hmm. the primary and secondary mm -hmm. light sources in this painting so that it didn't give you simply a multiplicity but something mm -hmm. like a movement of ambiguity so that the way that you then read the painting mm -hmm. led to the kinds of doubleness or uh, a double consciousness that you see beautifully worked out by Freud on the couch where of course all these conflicts of drives mm -hmm. are coming in. But even more in that, um, in that uh, um, Gombrich is very good on this, in these sort of conflicting forces in looking mm -hmm. at paintings where things actually, again, don't fit together. Mm -hmm. So every time where you feel this sort of movement and transformation of meaning, and this is very much a case in Hogarth, um, there's so much going on um, in these uh, pictures that he drew um, as kind of comic um, pictures, mm -hmm. that you, the idea that you could fix it through an iconographic method, or you could fix it by naming mm -hmm. the idea of the artwork, would be betrayed by the formal interplay of the elements of the material. And I see that to be also the case, the best about identity. Um, Fanon, uh, I was teaching Fanon recently, and this double consciousness between black and white, he doesn't resolve it. He doesn't resolve the double consciousness and, um, in race. He doesn't say I'm black or I'm. He, he talks about the, the social conflict mm -hmm. in being one thing and being another, the face and the mask, um, mm -hmm. being in constant conflict with each other. And I think that th this is the approach that at, at the moment I favor enormously in thinking about. I mean, maybe this is the hardest question, Lydia. I mean, your book and your earlier books, like most grand philosophy books are esoteric. I mean, play to a certain academic audience. Have you thought, I mean, with these political interests of how would you make things accessible? How would you 
teach it? And this is a utopian question, really. How would you, how would you get some larger group to, to, to find? Because in a sense, it seems to me that your material, like a lot of, like a lot of analytic philosophy, is very accessible. That is, if you're willing to have patience and work through it, you can follow it. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the snobbery of a vocabulary or something like that. But is this even a possible question or is this over the horizon? Um, I'm caught in different traps, traps um, in this respect because um, philosophers complain that I'm not doing proper philosophy because I'm, it's too much material that's actually about music and opera and painting mm -hmm. and so on. It's, it's too accessible. <laughs> Um, yeah. Those I thought I was, I, but I also, I don't, I don't like the idea that you either write for academics or you write for a general public. Right. I like to write for intelligent people and intelligence comes in all forms in life and they get right. different things. And the idea that we're, the academia is so cut off from a kind of intellectual world mm -hmm. is betrayed precisely by this kind of forum where there's plenty of people coming from all walks of life who are right. probably better read than half of you know half the professors. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. so I and the other the other thing about it, and I've learned this um, recently from having taken up the violin again and become uh, becoming a very serious musician again, and that is the idea that. You gotta do what you gotta do. I can't. I can't do, write it any other right. way. I don't right. write with a lot of jargon, and I don't like solving little philosophical mm -hmm. problems that I find inutterably boring. I like to feel that I'm contributing to a lot of debates in my own way. But I do the only thing I can do, and this is the only way I can write. And it's not, it's, people used to say that I was esoteric when I talked about Adorno, but in this book, I decided not to talk very much about Adorno, just so nobody could say you're being esoteric. They say Adorno, <laughs> esoteric, incomprehensible. Right, right. But actually, you know, you've got to learn how to read Adorno as well. It's, um, it's a, you know, I mean, writing is a complicated, interesting business. It's not that, you know, not to be simplified and... That's my thought on in accessibility. Carolyn, are you waving for any? Yeah. No, I Ad am. Adorno wants a review copy. <laughs> yeah, I like so great. So, uh, uh, Mr. Schwartz is very chatty. He, <laughs> I think he's, a, he's one of the. You're a ch you're a chatter literally, um, on Zoom, and it's um. They, uh, Proust ought to review this book. Um, maybe. Um, <laughs> not bad. Um, okay. yeah. She's our best um, NSC student. We're wow. so grateful for him to oh, join us. Um, yeah. Well, maybe Forget this is, bit. yeah, or go ahead. This might be a great place. Um, Can we to... stop and hear some poetry? And... Yes, yeah, yeah, poetry speaking begins. of Adorno. Um, and I'm just, language, yeah. Yes, so excited um, really to present our poet today. Um, so we have Lainey Brown with us, uh, poet, prose writer, teacher, and editor. Lainey Brown is the author of 14 collections of poems and four books of fiction, including Translation of the Lilies Back into Lists. It's a great title. Um, and that is just out, or we can pre-order that um, from Wave Books. And we'll put a link to that in the chat. Um, and she's also the author of many books of poems, but um, including In Garments Worn by Lindens from Tender Buttons Press. Um, some honors and awards include a Pew Fellowship, the National Poetry Series Award, uh, and many others. Um, so with that, Lainey, um, please take the stage. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail and um, Wave Books. I'm so happy to be here today. And it's a very auspicious day for poetry because today is the birthday of Bernadette Mayer and Norma Cole. So I just wanted to say happy birthday, Bernadette and Norma. And um, in just real brief introduction to my book that will be out any moment, 
uh, translation of the lilies back into lists, which I'll be reading from. I began this book with the idea of translating my daily to-do lists into poems. And so every poem is a list poem titled with a date, which contains not tasks, but thoughts surrounding daily occupations. I started writing this book in December of 2015, and it continues through May of 2016. And one way that this book can be read is by divination opening to any given date. So I'm going to read beginning in the middle of May and a few poems toward the end of the collection. <clears throat> May 11, 2016. Gratitude, my sister, we often quarrel. Our kids almost the same age at which we first met. I can't sleep with the door open, I wrote. And then I got up and closed the door. Morning sanctuary supports me, even though I am not awake. Do you know morning sanctuary? Sitting beside me, you took my hand, touched my hair. You didn't speak many eyes, but you were blue, silk, lemon, like indigo in a poem a cat wearing a dress, an abstract luminous presence. I can no longer visit my grandmother's house. Not only is our invented childhood over, we've also spent the childhoods of our children. First, later meant throwing everything in a closet when they were small. Second, later becomes a further projection the desire for a time when everything is less devastating. Dear missing conspirators of birth and page, assist us in finding words, not to beautify, but to understand beyond services. May 12th, 2016. Mature now or wait until later? Look, your delusions are all in bloom. Every spring, don't be duped by showy foliage. Still the same portals, chalices, not necessarily doorways or entrances, a looming directory of inadmissible doom, damp and forlorn gloom in the brain, or suddenly much too warm, as I approach the intersection, I'm thinking, be alert. Let's roll this fog out and then walk on it. But as non went on and on and exhausted by my own vicarious proclivities, texts became endless dull birds, larger than flight, furtive, preying on prone. Pronouncements. Never before have I seen scavengers so close, though often circling above, unimaginably slow, methodical, patient, pecking head, nodding up and down, calm now, pulling and ripping towns. What would happen if I approach with a slurred attack? Deferral is already dead, must keep moving half a stone well visible, formerly obscured by shrubbery. This isn't a sign unless it means release or the image of a large looming herd of mistakes. Remake myself, allowing dismemberment feed on gone. May 19th, 2016. Chekhov may have been a doctor, but he wasn't a mother and a writer. Mother, a job as taxing as doctor, yet no pay. The hours are longer, conditions may be hazardous, but even more precarious is your position in society. I made breakfast for one notion while the other slept, then took a walk and drove your thoughts to school. It feels like the dark ages 
even in the most liberated households where mothers slice dishes from archeological kitchens and fainting fires into which we thrust the simple privacy of eyes. We learn to speak singly and offer paralysis a place for recovery, a sound sewn into the hem of a frock. May 23rd, 2016. Because I'd been imprisoned, call it a crash, a campaign, an echo, best intentions rise early, unending but unheard. Advocates for soporifics insist, talk, aim at doors, grazing light, eroding guardianship with numbing frequency. Space isn't just an object. If I had nerves, they were membranes, dampness, culprits, easily rarefied. To insert yourself into emptiness requires air, steps outside rigor, spiders under chairs, what I learned at the cold cookout, deliberately incinerated pyrotechnics, more authentic versions of our thoughts were not available. Why had we forgotten our idiocy, intoning languages and locations we knew near to nothing about? My list of objections should come before wallowing. It's true, you have to leave us. We will vacate all encumbered premises, but first learn the pleasure of dwelling in your own perfect form and the imperative of inhabiting others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so, so much, Lainey. Um, everyone, please. Thanks to everyone. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Lydia and David, of course. Um, I just wanted to mention again that we all get a nice discount to Lainey's book um, if you want to check that link in the chat. Um, thanks for doing that, Wave. Um, and uh, yes, really, Lydia, David, what a wonderful conversation. Um, we also want to thank Hannah and Peter at Oxford University, at Oxford University Press for helping to make today's event possible. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we will upload today's combo shortly. And please join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Stephanie de Alessandro, Don Aids, and Marianne Cause on the event of Surrealism Beyond Borders at the Tate. And tomorrow we will conclude with a poetry reading by Jacob Kahn. Um, and we now encourage everyone to turn your microphones on and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so much for today. Bye. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 That was really interesting. Yeah. Loved it. Uh, the poetry, especially. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, David. So Lydia. Lainey, guys. such a great yeah. reading. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lydia. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, David. Well, yeah. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you for the beautiful reading also. Thank you so Thank much. You, Lainey. Thank and you, Lainey. Book. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, GT. Sarah, I own your phone call. I, I give you a ring super soon. <laughs> <laughs> I love that song. Love yeah, that we are working on several fronts with all the on fire and all, all ends with such a cosmic optimism. Good. Yes. So philosophy <laughs> helps because it's amplify our sense of wisdom over knowledge. So thank you, Lydia. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Much right. love and courage. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.